the age of 21 will continue. Collision shackles and bones, and the cookie stuff. The law has failed time and time again. We are angry. The students to showcase their talent. Good evening and a warm welcome to Oppie TV's webcast. If you would like to have your say in this evening's webcast, send us your tweets with the hashtag OPTV Live. In tonight's news, infrastructural problems in Makana municipality still persist after last year's protest over water cuts. An independent engineer's report has stated that some of the water and electrical substation infrastructure is in dire need of upgrades. The Summit Electricity Substation near PJ Olifir School is said to need over 20 million rand in upgrades alone. Durban-based live electronic duo Veranda Panda recently paid Grahamstown a visit. With their signature violin and electro sound, they brought a new dynamic to Grahamstown's live music scene. They were hosted by Mixlab, a group of local student DJs. In the run-up to national elections, conversations around which party would best serve the country have begun. Over 85% of eligible voters in the Eastern Cape have registered to vote, which is slightly higher than the national average. The elections, scheduled for the 7th of May, mark the first time the so-called Born Free generation will be eligible to vote, putting the spotlight on youth apathy and political participation. Sunday Times photographer James Oatway was recently awarded second place as International Newspaper Photographer of the Year. The Rose alumnus documents in conflict regions such as the DRC. He could not be immediately reached for comment as he was photographing in the Central African Republic this past week. Short film director Carl Robinson recently showcased his new film, Finding Grahamstown. The Rhodes alumnus worked with students and Grahamstown res residents to put it together. The satirical film is about the history of Grahamstown and its proceeds aim to contribute to the welfare of the town's donkeys. RPTV sat down with the young filmmaker. Uh, well, there were, yeah, there were many different inspirations. Uh, the first being probably just exploring some of the countryside around Grahamstown. Um, you know, Mountain Drive and some of the farms that we have just outside town are just visually, you know, unbelievable. Um, and we wanted to capture that on film. We wanted to, to find a medium which could portray its beauty. And yeah, this short film just was, yeah, the idea behind the short film was like, okay, this is a way to include some of the, just the beauty of the, the countryside. Uh, I think the message that we wanted people to take away from it is that the, the past can't be changed and we are here at this moment because of what happened in the past. Yeah. Over to Brandon and Doug for our sports. Thank you, Bonkeka. In sports tonight, in a grand challenge fixture, the Rhodes Under-21A rugby team was defeated by the Gardens Under-21 side. The fixture took place this Wednesday and was a tight affair. At the final whistle, Gardens walked away with a 19-15 victory. The annual Opie Olympics took place this Saturday afternoon. The event was organised by the Opie Dunn Union and was a day dedicated to off-campus students. They interacted together by taking part in numerous fun activities. Over 20 teams participated in the event. Now for some results. In cricket, the Rhodes' first 11 faced Northville on March 22nd, where they lost by 31 runs. The following day, Rhodes faced Glevendale and suffered their second straight defeat, this time by 32 runs. In soccer, the men's team was defeated by WSU Ibika. The final score read 2-0. In volleyball, the men's team defeated Mtata 2-0 and lost 2-1 against Ibika. The ladies' team defeated both Mtata and Ibika with the same scoreline of 2-1. In basketball, the men's and ladies' teams both emerged victorious against University of Forte and WSU Ibika on March 21st. And now for an interview with Rhodes student and SA Under-18 five-a-side hockey player Cody van Veek. Hi there, uh, I'm here with Cody van Veek. Uh, he's a member of the South African under-18 national hockey five side. Welcome, Cody. You've come to Rhodes to, to uh, yeah, pursue your hockey career um, along with some academics. Uh, yeah. Is Rhodes the best option for you, considering that there, there isn't a huge emphasis on sport within the institution? Well, um, this year is a little bit different compared to last year because um, Rhodes is also in the Varsity Cup this year. Yeah. Which means that um, obviously we're touring the country and stuff to play against different universities. And um, there's also more emphasis placed on hockey, 
because uh, Rhodes has also got like a physiotherapist this year, we've got a psychologist in the team. Sure. And then there's also Oaks from different provinces that have been brought in basically for hockey as well. So obviously also for academics, but hockey. Yeah, main, <laughs> mainly hockey. I, I understand that, that your birth date may not have been so convenient in your selection for the SF5 side. I hear you almost, or yeah. you basically made it by a day. Almost, what happened there? Because um, basically to qualify for the Youth Olympics, um, you have to be born between uh, the 1st of January, 96, and the 31st of December, uh, 99. And I'm literally born on the 1st of January. So if I had been <laughs> born three hours earlier or something, I probably would Hey, you cut it fine, eh? <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> hey, you just made it, man. Yeah. Sure, well, thanks very much for chatting to us, Cody. Uh, it's been awesome having you. Uh, it's um, a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Uh, yeah thanks. This has been Cody van Veek of the National uh, and 18 Fives hockey side. Thank you, Doug. That's all from the Sports Desk. We'll be right back. Watch Oppie TV. Hello, ich heiße Marco Schäfer und ich bin auf Oppie TV. Hi, my name is Marco Schäfer and I'm on Oppie TV. My name is Sam. Watch Oppie TV. Hi, my name is Titi and I'm on Oppie TV. Hi, I'm Olivier. I come from Mauritius and I'm here in Rhodes University to watch Oppie TV. Come and watch Oppie TV. My name is Olivia. My name is Tari and we're watching Oppie TV. You're watching Oppie TV. Thank you for joining us for this second edition of Makana in Crisis. We invite you to join this conversation by using the Twitter hashtag OPTV Live. In this series, OPTV aims to create a discussion about the quality of life for people in Grahamstown and its surrounds. This week we are focusing on basic education in the city and the Eastern Cape. This province's matric pass rate of 64.9% was the lowest nationally in comparison to the overall percentage of 78.2%. But despite this poor performance, pass rates perhaps do not paint the full picture of the challenges, complexities and successes in this city and province. Tonight we welcome history lecturer and education activist Dr. Nomalanga Mkize, the South African numeracy chair professor Melanie Graven, and recently matriculated student Aviwe Menze, who is now studying at Rhodes. Thank you all very much for joining us. It's great to have you in here tonight. Uh, Dr. Mkize, if I could start with you. Um, I would like to know how you would describe the state of basic education, particularly mm -hmm. at state-owned schools in Grahamstown. Yeah. Now that we are here in 2014, can we mm -hmm. call this a crisis and why? Well, in Grahamstown, yes, we can call it a crisis, particularly in the townships. Obviously, the uh, two or three Model C schools in town aren't uh, suffering the same crisis, but in the township, yes. Um, about 10 to 15 years ago, the township schools were producing some of the top metrics in the province. We're talking here seven, eight distinctions per s top student out of the township. Now our top metrics are battling with the crumbling system. Our top metric last year got three distinctions, and that was a huge celebration because it's kind of hard to get any distinctions out of our learners anymore. It's not the learners' fault. The system is crumbling. Can you perhaps elaborate a little bit more mm. on that? So from when these students were getting seven or eight mm. distinctions to now, what is it? Uh, what are the most major factors that have influenced this decline? Look, there's a lot of stuff that has happened within the Eastern Cape Department of Education itself, its inability to control its uh, district level management. Um, apart from the general problems that we've seen in the education system nationally, too much curriculum change, teacher confidence dropping and so on. But locally, I would say that one of the biggest problems has just been the inability for uh, the inability of our our local district and our local teaching cohort to have the will to do anything about the problems that they see. If 10, 15 years ago we were producing top black metrics, and I mean at the top, top level, and the same schools are not producing that, something has happened in those schools' teaching cultures. Um, it's, not a, it's not a resources issue. Mm. Something politically and socially has transformed the will within the teaching cohorts of Grahamstown to keep producing those results. Uh, Professor Graven, if I can ask you, you are the chair in numeracy, so mathematics is your specialty. Um, would you echo Dr. Mkize's sentiments or do you have a, a particular different feeling about the situation? Well, sure. I mean, there are challenges in, in our area. We are one of the poorest provinces and, um, you know, our education results are reflecting poorly 
um, at, at the matric level. I, I do see a lot of hope in the Grahamstown area. Um, within our chair, we work with a lot of the primary schools, and I think it's a good move for um, a refocusing of attention on primary maths education or primary education in general, not just waiting kind of till the matric. Yeah. And then everybody gets into a panic, and it's kind of too late to catch people up. I would agree there's a lot of low teacher morale and I think that the broader provincial problems in education and the crises we had three years ago with feeding schemes collapsing and, you know, temporary teachers, you know, losing their jobs and then needing to be um, reinstated and all the rest of it, uh, th that stuff impacts horribly on teachers morale. So, um, and in terms of all the curriculum changes that you spoke about, yes, you know, teachers are constantly trying to play catch up. Um, but I, I also think that learner dispositions have a, have a role to play. I think learners aren't taking enough agency and understanding that learning is also their responsibility. Um, I think there's too much of a kind of what I call over compliance going on in the school system where kind of teachers are focusing on complying to assessments, whether it's matric or whether it's getting their marks in or, you know, learners are complying to doing whatever the teacher tells you. But it's all kind of set up for not really having agency, not really thinking for yourself around what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, in a subject like mathematics, you know, if one believes that being good at maths is simply about listening to what the teacher tells you to do, one actually will never ever be good at it. One needs to go home, figure it out, struggle with it a little bit, but keep trying. Persistence is absolutely important. Making sense of how and why to do something, figuring out your own way of doing it, is in fact critically important. And listening to a teacher is only one aspect of, mm -hmm. of that. And our research is showing very much that learners believe that to be a successful maths learner you needing to listen to the teacher or being be born clever at mathematics. So mm. learners don't seem to believe that they have the agency mm. to learn when a teacher's not present. Mm. And, you know, from our own school experience, I mean, I went to a school that didn't have particularly good teachers. A lot of my lessons were free periods, so the opportunity to learn was low, etc. But, you know, most of my learning then took place at home, you know. So, so having the agency to say, and a lot of the success stories are saying the same thing. It's learners who prepare to then take the agency to try to figure things out for themselves. Now, I'm not saying that all learners can do that. They obviously need to also be inducted into ways to learn. Yeah. And I think our school system needs a complete overhaul. I'd just like to ask um, a viewer, especially now that we have you in studio, um, you were the top matriculant in your district last year with, yeah. with three distinctions. So first of all, congratulations Thank for your you efforts. So it's nice to see you here Thank at Rhodes. Um, I would like to ask from your perspective, because you have just come out of the Grahamstown education system, yeah. could you perhaps talk about your educational experience here and tell us, you know, we want to know from a student's perspective, is all of this, what we're, what we're hearing, is this accurately describing what's going on? Um, yeah, what the difference um, from primary school to high school was huge. In primary school, the support was very intense. And then when I got to high school, it was different. Um, the teachers were not there sometimes in class and we had a shortage of textbooks and one cannot expect a school with a shortage of textbooks and a shortage of teachers to actually be able to prepare their, learn their learners for, for university. Um, this really frustrated me. I was so frustrated. I felt my right to basic education was violated. And But then at some point, this actually pushed me to actually um, try to take responsibility for my own education and actually get out there and try to pass my trick very well. So regardless of all the challenges, they also motivated me to actually make sure that I pass my metric and get myself to where I want to be. But it wasn't easy. It was not easy at all because I expected my teachers and the school to give me enough support to actually make it, but it was not the case. Um, everything was delayed um, last year. Um, we had strikes, we had um, a shortage of teachers, you know, and that really frustrated everyone. But I had to, at some point, take that as a motivation to actually 
try and push and make sure that I pass my matric regardless of the challenges. Mm. Uh, talking about teachers and perhaps parents as well, Dr. Mkiza, I'd like to ask you, um, in an article, I think it was last year or the year before, you, you said that education has come to be treated with disrespect and disdain by educated black professionals that administer it. Can you please talk a little bit more about this mm. and do you think that there's a way out of this problem? Um, basically, what I meant by there's disrespect and disdain by black prof uh, the professionals in the system is that those of us who have the benefit of education as black people, I mean, we, we it's always been center of uh, the political culture. You have to get an education to get somewhere. So now when you hear things like what Avio is talking about, the teachers are not there. Why are the textbooks not there? Because they've been delivered, mm. all right? Not because there was no money for them. Mm. So there's mm. a whole range of people in the education system, right, from the province level, right down to the person who's supposed to cut the grass at the school. There's a whole chain here that people are just not taking care of. And my, my challenge to that then is then, but then we lived, you know, we got our education. So what are we saying to the next generation of black children? What about their right to, uh, you know, explore their own freedom? Mm -hmm. So that is that. What is the hope? Um, there's always hope because these are. It's about children. So with 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 each moment, you have to keep telling yourself there's hope. And I do believe so. I mean, there's so many initiatives like some of the initiatives that you're uh, involved in. There's so much research going into the structural problems, the curriculum problems, the learning problems, the teaching problems. So we're beginning to understand the whole breadth of the problem much better. I think. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Prof. Graven, I'd like to ask you, from a student's perspective, perhaps at Rhodes and perhaps at other institutions like Wits, where you've come from, what do you think is the role of, of students in this particular matter, those that are at university? Perhaps if we can apply that to Graham's Tom now, where do you see students at this university? Can we assist in this problem? What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I've been arguing a lot is that uh, uh, kind of working on this proverb of it takes a village to raise a child. I don't think that any one person can solve this problem. I think absolutely all the things that you've raised all the way down the education departmental chain, those things need to be figured out. But we can't wait for that to happen. We can put pressure, we can be activists, we can try to make it happen. But I think each of us can go in there with the community and provide our support. So there's a lot of community initiatives that people can get involved with. Um, we run a whole range of after-school mathematics clubs at some of the schools that we work with. Um, and people can get involved with those kinds of things. Go and work with an after-school club, sit with a group of learners, help them to learn. Clearly, somebody like a VWA has incredible skills on learning how to learn. And often those are the skills that got you through. You learned how to learn, despite all the many challenges that you fa faced. And I think that students can, especially those students who at university, um, have incredible resources on helping students to learn how to learn, no matter what the subject is. So I would say sitting down with a group of students after school, supporting them in their homework, in their learning, you know, developing those dispositions of you can do it. I know systems are unfair. I know systems aren't ideal. But you have the agency, yeah, to get through it. Let's work together. So I think starting to set up kind of after school study groups um, is an incredible path to success. We've, we've certainly seen a lot of um, success with it. And when I first came to Grahamstown, I uh, ran an after school maths club got some people involved in supporting students from the township schools. And I mean, one of the learners got 100% for maths. I mean, he got a, got a scholarship to come here to Rhodes, got the kind of provincial award or whatever. But he just participated in that after-school club, came there once a week, and students worked together. So even while their teachers weren't present um, for some periods of time, they came together and said, how are we going to figure this out together? And then they came to work with me to say, this is what we know we don't know. How can you help us? So I would say to all the students, go out there, start a little study group with students in one of the schools and just work with them on where, where they're at. Inspire them, motivate them and help them to learn how to learn. Aviwa, I would like to ask you, coming from the university, is, what, what kind of relationship do you think that creates, say, with upstart learners? And is there something that we can learn from this experience to perhaps encourage this agency that you're talking about to not treat learners like it is their fault that, that education is not working, but actually come from a space of saying, we believe that you have this equal right to education and we want you to have it. I mean, is there something that we can learn from upstart? Um. Upstart played a huge role in my life. Um, all the road students that came to tutor us, every time they came to us, I was so motivated. I wanted to be like them, you know. And 
exactly uh -huh. and because they spoke with us in english we had to learn from them because in, in our school you don't get that you don't get a teacher um trying to make sure that your english skills are good so every time that the road students came to us they actually motivated us maybe they didn't know that they were actually motivating us mm. but it was for me i took it as a form of motivation um because their presence was there, I was so motivated. I really, really wanted to be like them. And that actually got me forward. And I actually saw myself as one of them. And now, yeah, you know, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Right, well, thank you very much to everyone. I'd just like to open the floor to all of you. Are there any additional comments or thoughts that you have before we conclude the broadcast? Well, I'm really pleased at the kind of work that you are doing. And, you know, and I think that we should be getting more creative around how to solve these problems. And I think things like Upstart mm. are an example of how mm. how creativity in solving the problem does have pr pr produced good results. Mm. For sure. And I think what Aviwe has just said in relation to what students can go out there and do. If you go and work with a bunch of students, what they're seeing is they're seeing you as a role model. Exactly. And the more we can have local role models, because the problem when we put these kind of people from far out there, you know, to be the role models, people don't identify with them, yeah. you know. If a VW goes around to schools and says to students, this is how I made it, despite yeah. the challenges, I've sat with the same challenges you're sitting with today, but this is how I made it work for me. I think that that's going to mm. go an enormous way to inspiring our learners in the same way that the upstart mentors inspired you. Yeah. So really just want to encourage the students to get out there and to work with as many of our local Grahamstown learners and schools as they can because this is all of our problem mm -hmm. and we can't wait for the Department of Education mm -hmm. to get no. it right. We just can't keep waiting. Anything more from you everywhere? Um, I would just like to say that to all the learners and local schools they shouldn't um, hesitate to take responsibility for their education. I mean we have a role to play. Everyone has a role to play to, to make sure that the system is working efficiently. You know, I felt violated. I felt my right to basic education was violated, but that didn't make me, you know, give up, you know, lose hope. So I think all the learners, they should take responsibility for their education and actually go forward. There great. is hope. That's good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to all of you thank for you. joining us. This has been very really great. You. Hope to see you again. All right, and thank you very much to our viewers for joining us on Oppie TV Live this evening. Make sure you stay tuned for our election night broadcast, which will be coming up next month. Stay tuned.